okay, Salvia leucophila, the purple sage that grows up across the Whittier, the Puente Hills over there in Whittier. I've seen it wild over there too. One of the only places with strictly purple sage. You'd be upset at the look of this, okay? So I want you to memorize what this leucophila looks like right here as a species, because I'm going to be showing you our version in the crescent, okay? It's a cultivar, and again, I'll explain what that word is and why it looks complete. Well, yes, actually, because you, you're you're with me, so you can. But normally, we don't want people <laughs> peeling on the plants. But yes, yes, you can. No, and and you'll be able to. I especially want you to smell the one that we have in the crescent too, so you can smell the leaf. So that's a sage. We're gonna look at that one. This right here. Does anybody know what this is? With these brown, spent seeds? No. This, yes, it's a buckwheat. Very good. This is Areogonum fasciculatum. It's a regular, standard, scrappy buckwheat that grows all over the foothills. Okay. Now you think, hmm, why would I want that in my landscape? It doesn't look very, very interesting, except maybe you like this color. I'm going to show you cultivars of this that are great ground cover. And you're going to think, ground cover, really? Yes. Again, a cultivar, cultivar, it's the third time I use that word. The cultivar is a selection from nature on some mutation or some sport, which means the plant grew differently than the regular plant. So plant geeks, even more geekier than me, are out hunting for these sports or these mutations, and they take pieces of these plants that they think, oh my god, this one's really low growing, or oh, the flowers on this one are really deep pink, I like this. So they're either collecting seeds and hoping it becomes true to form when they propagate it, or they're taking pieces of the plant and they're propagating it asexually, cloning. So when we have cultivars, they're selected from nature, having some kind of characteristic that we especially like. How did they know if a buckwheat like that looks like a shrub? You said you have one that's, that's ground cover, correct. How do you know it's a buckwheat? <laughs> How, how do you know it's a, a mutation of that? Right, good question. Because everything else about the plant reads buckwheat. And they could actually test, test at this point they could test the genetics. Right, and see even where it, where it was different. Or if it's a subspecies, because it gets more detailed botanically. But yeah, in, in every other aspect, it meets the qualifications of a buckwheat. Nearby it, I guess. Right, right. Probably, and in the right uh, ecological grouping. The other plant that I want to talk about that's especially outrageous the form we have is right behind us, right here. Does anybody know what this monster is right here? This is called coyote bush or coyote brush. It's a baccarat. Okay, and you think, oh my god, why would I want this in my landscape? Again, surprise, 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 we have a ground cover, a matting form of this, okay? And there are so many reasons why you should plant this in your garden. I'm going to talk about it in a second, okay? And if you, if you were trying to believe what I'm saying right now, you'd say, oh, I, I need to leave this class. It makes no sense. But wait till I show you, <laughs> wait till I show you what we have in the garden over there and, and its purpose in the garden. So, sage, and let me just review and then I'll Sage, the buckwheat, and this coyote bush, okay? These are the species that they would look like just as scrappy on the foothills in October, right? Almost, you know, so dormant that it looks toasty, right? Like, oh my God, this is never gonna come back. The buckwheat's all flopped over. You can barely see any leaves on here. Barely see, there's leaves in there, but you know, it doesn't look busy with leaves. Why? A lot of them have fallen just to keep the plant dormant, right? And this guy's just out of control. But it happens to be flowering right now, which is part of the elements that make it a, a good and I'll talk about that why. Okay, so these are the species, the original ones that you would see in nature or in the foothills as you're hiking. Now we're going to go see those selections, the cultivars in the garden. So let's make our way back over to uh, the kiosk and hang a right. Coming out on a limb here, assuming that you think this is pretty, like I think this is pretty. This is our uh, Salvia leucophila. So it's our purple sage, same same species, but this one is a cultivar. This one is called Point Sal Spreader. And you don't have to write it down because I'll send you the, the info on this, but Point Sal Spreader. And I'd love to give you permission as we walk by it to grab a leaf. I think, and you can hold me to this, every sage, all of our native sages, every one of them smells different. I mean, they're very unique, right? So this one, this one's got a great fragrance. And this is one plant planted from a gallon 
two and a half years ago. From a gallon, it was only just this is one plant, and this is the profile of the plant. Now, the original species that I was standing next to, right, it was obviously it was taller, lankier, way fewer leaves, right? And it had all the old seed heads still on it, if you notice, right? Those crusty brown seed heads. Do you see any seed heads on here? Just a few, exactly. Why? We've trimmed them off. Okay, so we're now in that M word, the maintenance. Okay, now, so here we go. I'm introducing you to a specific plant, and I'm about to tell you the maintenance. Is this First, part of the plant? This no, that's a different guy over there. He's kind of stuck in the corner. That's Chuparosa. Justicia. I'll let you the bone, though. This one is all sages can be cooked with, yes. Oh. They just have different flavors, so you have to be kind of careful. Some of them are really, really good. I like to experiment. I like to toast the sage, actually, and then throw it in my food. And what the color do you have? Good question. It's between pink and purple, so it's kind of a pinky lavender and a little on the light side. So, so this point cell spreader has been chosen from nature, this cultivar, because it is low growing and it's spreader. Right? That's right in the name, point cell spreader. So people love this in the landscape, and I do too. I can't recommend this high in Thailand. It's just been planted, established in a minimal way, and walked away. So it's so, very, very minimal. So it actually spreads, or is it volunteers coming? Up? No, it's actually spreads. This is one plant fanned out. Wow. Exactly. One plant fanned out. This is this is probably its maximum diameter, and it will not increase in height. However, each of these terminal ends will probably produce flowers. So it will just do its flowering thing now. Should be glorious this spring, because she was only like semi-flowering last year, just a handful of flowers. This year, I'm, I'm imagining she's going to be robust in flowering. So you should come back and visit. What else was I going to say? Is this a fast growing? Yes, very fast growing. Again, this is only two years in here from a gallon container. Yeah. What is the difference as far as the water goes? Okay. Water, good, good question. Thank you. That was that's where I was thinking I was gonna go. The one that we started off with is obviously zero water. There's just just like the footnote. Okay. I could go zero water on here too, if I needed to. Okay. I'm not, obviously, and she's much more lush. Okay. She looks great with the amount of water we're giving her. I give her no more than twice a week she gets watered, and at this point she's getting watered by hand. Okay, we're going to talk about hand watering in establishing. I'm hand watering her here because the rest of my hugel, this hill over here, has some plants on it that I am still hand watering because I'm establishing them. After I'm done establishing them, come next year, I'll stop the hand watering, I'll turn on our overhead sprinklers, and then they'll just get doused twice a week for 40 minutes. Now 40 minutes sounds like a lot, but if you've been on our tour before, you know that our MP rotators, the, the pop-up heads, deliver the water slowly and in large drops. So it sounds, 40 minutes sounds like a long time, but it's less water actually delivered. It happens slower, so the infiltration happens better. Now, that's not what we're here to talk about today is the watering and the irrigation. That's a different workshop but it relates to the plant's success. Because so far, this guy has just been on some overhead and then just by uh, hand water. Now I hand water twice a week and I do almost a watering can, two gallons each time, okay? Yes, sir. So if this is spreading, where do you know where it's spreading water? Good question, that's a great question. So if it's spreading, where? how do I know where to water? Yes, that's great. And that brings me to a little pointer. When I'm establishing a plant, obviously it's coming out of the root ball, right? I just put that root ball in the ground. I need to make sure that that root ball does not desiccate, that does not dry out. So when I'm establishing it and I'm watering it, I gotta get some water on that root ball. Obviously, that's where the plant's original roots are, right? And it's in danger of drying out, especially if it's really compact with roots. So make sure that's watered first, but gradually, Every time I'm watering, I'm increasing the diameter, that circumference of where I'm watering. Until finally now, I'm pouring water at the outside ring of this particular plant. Sometimes we call that a drip line on a tree, right? Where the most of the water drips after a rain. That's where those feeder roots actually end on a plant. So it's important to actually match the ends of those roots with where you apply that water. If I'm always applying the water in the center, 
that's the only place that that plant is going to put its roots. So I'm encouraging it to move those roots out. So I'm increasing that every time I water. Now again, that's just for establishment. Come next year, I don't have to worry about that anymore, but I know she's already has a nice, you know, nice wide root network. And I'm also watering, what's that? Is that the first year then? Yes, yes. And when I use that word establishing, I am talking about basically a year to a year and a half, to a year and a half of this kind of really careful care. But again, if you do the careful care up front and correctly, you can walk away from it gradually as it gets more established, okay? Yes, Pia. Um, I see your mulch, you've got pine needles yes. versus this one. Right. So no, I, that's, another, that's another thing I wanted to highlight. Thank you for bringing that up. It's actually not pine needles. This is actually carex. This is our grass that we thatched over there. And I'll show you where we thatched it out. And I'm actually very proud of this fluke. I put this carex up here as a mulch on this hill and I discovered that, oh my God, this stuff acts great on a slope. This mulch has gone nowhere. Where bark, woody mulch, it slips down the hill, right? But this stuff has been brilliant. It's interlocked like, like this kind of web. So it's just, it's stuck here. So I thought, you know what? Write that down, John, because I want to remember that. Like if you have a slope and you're desperate for mulch, Look for some grass. This is wi more wiry grass. This is our carex, right? But it works great on this slope. So for, thank you for uh, bringing up that question. That's why this looks different. It was an experiment that I decided was a great thing to kind of duplicate. I assume that helps to keep the weeds down. Yes, absolutely. It starves out of the weeds. And it, again, it acts like a, an insulating blanket over your surface. I like to say, don't leave any surface uncovered in the California landscape, okay, in our native, uh, our native or drought tolerant landscape. The only caveat is if you're uh, leaving some space for bees to do their underground nesting. If you're into native bees, they're going to need some exposed soil to do their nesting because a lot of our native bees actually burrow and produce and reproduce underground. And they need a bare soil for that. We just learned about that out here too this year because we're, we're putting together a new native bee garden. So I'm researching that as well. They need some open soil. But otherwise, you're covering up everything because you're insulating the spaces between your plants. Another hint. I like to plant <laughs> plants together. Okay? I could go to battle with landscape designers over this. Okay? My designing and my theory is Let's bunch the plants together because they immediately benefit from having been next to each other. The humidity is increased. The watering that you're doing by hand and maintaining goes in one area instead of you going between all these different plants, right? If you water one area, they're used to gaining water in that way and they benefit from the humidity of each other. So I like to cluster plants together. Mind you, you run into problems in my own home landscaping. I've had to say, oh my God, that's just too big and it's too close to the other thing. So I have to reduce it or move it. But in the meantime, I think it's a healthier start than just peppered plants over the landscape because they can desiccate too easily that way. So, about, How much water do you say you can water this? I do a two gallon container. Depends on how hot it is actually, but at least once a week. And again, she's, she's in her second year. And I'm only doing that now rather than the overhead water because I have other ones and I have this whole irrigation section turned off because of that. Turned off, right? And you're thinking, wait, aren't we establishing our plants? Yes. Again, I'm hand watering to establish them because I know I'm getting a, a good bulk of water on each plant and I'm able to to engineer that application of water so that it's intensely big and then spread out as infrequently as I can get away with. Does that make sense? So it's a deep, infrequent watering for your establishment. Those are the two words you remember, deeply and infrequently, okay? Two gallons seems minimal for that whole... That's because she's, she's already established pretty good. Okay. Yeah, if, so, she were, if she were any younger, I would, more, I would worry okay. more on it. Uh, if she were just now in the ground, I'd probably put that two gallon just for that gallon. I mean, if she would be on, all that two gallon would go to that one gallon plant. Yeah. And, and again, as infrequently as I can get away with it, if I had a week of 110 degrees, I'm going to be on there probably more than, more than I would otherwise. 
again, this it's a tricky time to establish your natives, and I won't lie about it. You might have some candidates just lose because it's, it, it's tricky, but and it's essential. That's why we don't plant in July, because if you had to do that deep watering in July, guess what? Our native plants do not like rain in July. Mm -hmm. It doesn't, that doesn't happen here, right? The rain happens in January and February. That's why we plant corresponding to that wet season. So I can just water the heck out of her if I needed to. And she's not going to have any ill effect from that extra water, mm -hmm. right? Because it's just a bigger rainy season. Pretend. But if it's July and I'm giving it too much water, there are viruses that grow in wet, warm soil that our plants are not immune to. So you're going to vector disease and watch your plant lose and rot. Okay, so the best window, again, Halloween to Valentine's Day, 100 days, right? Okay, so here's our sage. We're going to go off the path and we're going to visit the buckwheat that I'm going to show you. See, everything in this arboretum has a tag on it. And you are absolutely invited to walk up to a plant and look for that tag, right? That's why we're here as an institution. So all of it is a learning experience and a learning garden. And though you may not see people walking through the landscape, if you know what you're doing and you take light steps to get to the plant to find that tag, please feel free to do that. That's why we're here, okay? This is all for your, your gain and your knowledge, okay? This garden around in this triangle is strictly native and it has been put together in a theme. And the theme is actually culturally significant plants to the indigenous peoples that work here. And I say culturally significant, either as a food source or as a cultural item. For example, um, supplying the basket material, the, the pieces of slender wood that were woven into the incredible baskets that the indigenous people used here. Mind you, you all know that the indigenous people here did not make clay pots. Like the ceramics were used in other parts of the Southwest. The California Indians were the basket maker. They could make baskets that were water, the non-permeable baskets. It was incredible. Some of, the, oh, some of the resources that they used were in their environment, including the big tree behind me, and I'll talk about that in a second. So these plants were selected for the school kids that marched through here with the docents. And they can stop here and focus on a couple plants that have cultural significance. Now, I can talk about any and all these, and we can spotlight, and if you have a question, I'll give you a chance to ask about anything you see behind me. But, I promised that I was going to revisit the cultivars of what we saw over there looking scrappy. This is not a cultivar. This is the straight buckwheat Areogonum fasciculatum. This is exactly the match to the one that I was standing next to in Roots and Shoots over there, okay? Already it looks a little different than the one over there, right? This one looks like, gee, it has more leaves on it for one thing, right? Its form is a little bit more dense and rounded, a little bit more kept. That's because it's been in a regularly watered landscape over here. Regularly watered. Now, watered how? By hand still, because I'm still establishing these guys, okay? So keep that in mind. Later on, it'll be just from the irrigation. See, this is our regular Areogonum fasciculatum, looking a little better because it's in my landscape and I want it to look decent, okay? Do you see any of those brown flower heads on this? No. I left them on for a little while while they looked interesting, and then I made an executive decision and said, okay, time to reduce that. They're looking a little scrappy. Why? Because I'm concerned with the aesthetics out here. And that's part of our, that's part of our dilemma. I'm creating a drought tolerant landscape, California natives, I want them to look decent. What's it require? Okay. When those seed heads looked a little messy, I went in very tediously and took off all the seed heads. Tedious, yes, tedious. Okay. <laughs> if you're a gardener like me, you don't mind tedium sometimes. That's the name of the game. So I took off those flower heads to make it look better and neater. Now, the really showstopper is behind you. So this is Areogonum fasciculatum. This is a cultivar called Warrener Lytle. Warrener Lytle. Warrener Lytle is a plants person who happened to discover this mutation somewhere in a coastal area, I believe. And so this has been reproduced over and over and over and over asexually, cloned. Okay? Now, it has flowers on it that resemble all the other buckwheats 
Mm -hmm. And they'll turn this dark chocolatey uh, kind of umber brown, dark chocolate brown. So that looks nice too. But look at the profile of this plant. Mm -hmm. I'd say it's no longer than probably 16 inches tall overall. And each of these gallon sized uh, plants is now spreading and it's probably three feet wide in the diameter. So this is what the perfect cultivar is, right? It comes from your regular species in the environment. This one has a characteristic that suits a lot of gardeners needs. For example, I need a ground cover. I need a drought tolerant ground, ground cover. I need something to grab the soil on my slope. This is a good candidate, okay? This is also cool because this brings in loads of native bees and butterflies. So if we like that H word, habitat, this is another great habitat. Okay. So this will occupy this entire stretch over here, eventually. And it's actually, you could walk on it and not do too much damage, but I'm not gonna demonstrate that too. But, but this is a nice, durable thing to have in the garden to replicate a ground cover. Okay? Not one that you would walk across necessarily, but that would provide this carpet of grain. But this also uh, is a nitrogen builder? No, not buckwheats. Not buckwheats. Because we get some buckwheat that we threw in our garden. Uh -huh. so, Right. There's a. So what there, is the difference? Right. That's the herbaceous weedy buckwheat. That's mm -hmm. that's the Japanese buckwheat. It's it's a okay. different plant altogether, but it's the same name they call it. Yes. And permaculture uses that for the nitrogen. Mm -hmm. Exactly. I know exactly the plant you're talking about. Does different this plant. Full sun? This requires full sun, but it'll do with a little scrap of shade as well. I had a problem with these because we put these in in very hot beginning of the spring last year and I was sick because I thought we were gonna lose these in fact you may notice that there's a blank area over here okay it was not intentional we had plants all the way up here okay we lost all of these why because these went in in a bad timing so I had to put stupid things like a, a, a cover over this so it was covered from the Sun so the sun wasn't going to dry the heck out of them. I was worried about them when I put them in. Why all the worry? Why all the fuss? Again, it didn't go in there in the right That sweet window from Halloween to Valentine's Day. We put these in in May. And then a week and a half later, it was over 100. So I was crying. Yes, I was crying. And I thought we were going to lose all of them. And trust me, they went through a really forlorn period. So I'm just like applauding these guys right now. They look so good after all this. So I, I, I feel successful being that we, we, we nursed them through that time. Now they're really good. Now they're really good. I still water them by hand just because I don't quite believe that they're this good yet. <laughs> but I know they will be and I can turn around and let this be watered over here. So this is a great plant, again, from the, the species, the cultivar, Warner Lytle. in our garden. This guy. Now you're thinking, wait a minute, weren't we looking at a plant that was like 13 feet high or whatever and it was all over the place? And we, yes, this is the cultivar right here. This is called Pigeon Point. This is the coyote bush Pigeon Point. You'll find that the cultivars actually have curious names because they're either named after the place where they were found or the person that found them in the wild. And then that's usually listed in half quotes if you see it in a botanical magazine or a catalog or at Armstrong. So this is this is Baccarus pilulatus pigeon point. And you can see that, what does it act like? Like a ground cover, right? Here it is. This is one plant splaying forward. It's full of bees and it's about five feet wide. Now, I say full of bees and I think, hmm, it's flowering. What's the date? We're almost at the end of October, and this thing is flowering? Yes, that's why this is such an exceptional candidate to your native landscape, because it brings in the habitat. At this time of the year, it's providing your bee population with the, the pollen and the um, nectar, protein and sugar, right? And not a lot is available at this time of the year, because not a lot in the native garden, not a lot is blooming. 
So this is a great candidate. And I love how wide it is, how low growing it is, and this color is the same color all year. All year. This never looks bad. And this can get away with less and less and less water all along until you're basically giving it nothing. You saw what the regular coyote bush looked like on that corner, right? Do you think it gets a lot of care on that corner? Absolutely not, right? And it's still robust. This has got the same qualities, but in a different form. So this is great candy. So did you trim it? Is that what it is? No, it actually grows this way because of its mutation. It grows low. So they'll say low growing or spreader, just like that other salvia. When you say mutation, that was the real one, yes. but you muted it with what? It mutates in nature. See, our, our plants are always mutating in nature. That's what a plant person that's searching out, they will find a version of that coyote bush in nature and say, this is an odd mutation, let's, let's replicate this. So literally, our different forms of cultivars all come from some exception in nature. Yep. Sometimes they're engineered that way by hybridization, but usually a cultivar is just encountered and then replicated. So the name is the name is different from that to this. The the it's they both have the same name, that. but this one has a half quote name attached to it, which indicates that it's a, it's a variety cult or a cultivar. Okay. Correct. Yes. Correct. The Pia's question though: Do I trim this at all? The only reason I would trim this is if I wasn't happy with the, the height coming out of the middle here, but I'm, this is gonna get no taller than this, and I'm fine with it. We're so happy with this plant. You can see that we, we added more into this landscape. There's a newbie. There's another newbie over there by the sign. Here's one behind us. So you can see, and here's one here too, right? So you can see the larger ones have been in here an extra year, and the smaller ones are a year behind. No, so smaller ones from a, from a gallon? One gallon, yeah. These were two, so you can see the progress. You don't do cuttings or, or, or you don't, this doesn't grow seed now. Like you know, that. I, don't, I haven't seen it. I have not seen it. Sometimes our cultivars, because they've been reproduced asexually, they don't, right. they don't, they don't have uh, viable seeds, yes. And but I have not seen it reseed. It doesn't do well in shape. <laughs> it does not do well in shape, correct. Yeah. It'll be too lanky in shape, yeah. Be, right. The medallion one. Mm. <laughs> so there's the, the coyote bush. We saw the salvia and we saw the buckwheat. I want to show you two versions of our desert willow. And I mentioned that we have two styles of pruning now. And I'll also show you on some maintenance. So we're going to come to the end of the spring. Covering up this buckwheat because the sun was too intense when we planted and that was one of our methods. How did I take care of watering them? Yes. It was probably needing more water at the time, but I was intent on checking how quickly it was drying out or not. Because it was hot and I know it's going to need more water, that doesn't erase the fact that between waterings, I know that that plant should go dry. That's the best, right? All of our natives and our drought tolerant plants, when you're establishing, make sure that they go dry enough before applying more water, right? Or else you're you're teasing it with too much water that it might get used to. That's one danger. The second danger is you'll just kill it because it's too much water. So you don't want either thing to happen. But you're always moving toward encouraging the plant to accept less and less water. Oh, eventually, again, some of them you could step away. This beautiful, gorgeous, lovely thing here. This, this baby requires no water, zero, zero, zero. She's probably got roots all over this landscape right now, so she's achieving water from everybody else's a portion. But it's a tree, and she's meant to be in drought circumstances. This is Chilopsis linearis. It's the desert willow. And it's got gorgeous flowers on her, and there's none available right now. They look like penstem in their trumpet shape. And this particular variety is called burgundy. That's the variety name, and that's the color of the flower. They are absolutely gorgeous velvety trumpet deep-throated flowers that the hummingbirds just go nuts over. The whole tree was in flower. I've had people literally come to me and say, John, what's this? And come to me the next day and say, I found one at Armstrong and it's in my garden because I love this tree. So that's, this has been really a, a real hit. It is deciduous. What does deciduous mean? Drops Drop leaves. leaves, exactly. So come winter, this will be naked all the leaves will drop so it is deciduous which 
if you're planting a tree in your landscape and you want your window to have that spot of sunshine in the winter time and your winter is facing south your window is this is a great thing to plant in front of that window why because in the winter time you'll have your sunshine but in the summertime you'll be shaded right so thinking about putting a deciduous tree in your landscape think about how it's going to evolve over time and how it will be different across your season right remember when you're establishing things too or or preparing to plant the garden I kind of made mention that you have to kind of gauge where that solar angle is going to be at different times of the year. And incorporating deciduous trees into that also kind of dovetails with that thought. Do I want shade all year? Do I want opened up in the winter time too? Pick a deciduous tree. These grow in alluvial circumstances in the desert. That means where there are washes that get periodically flooded depending on the rains in the, in the desert, sometimes happening in the summertime which is opposite our normal patterns here in Southern California, right? So this guy would never be unhappy about getting water in the summer. So this will take water in the summer. It'll take extra water from your garden landscape too. And I want to come back to that in a second. This is the, the tree that the native people have used for a lot of their back basket making um, pieces. In fact, they did an ancient kind of pruning that generated long sapling kind of branches that were free of side branches, so they were big strips. And they knew how to trim the tree to generate those branches for the basket making. This is also a water cleanser. This actually helps remove contaminants in water. So if you have some, some contaminated area of your garden, or if you're using gray water, like I am in my house too, this is a great thing to accept the most alkaline of your gray water. This, this plant will accept that. Where some of your other plants, because of the pH in that gray water, they might be ill affected by it. This so one can you stand. can pour the drainage back in directly to the other the plant? I don't know directly, but because I would like to dilute that. But this will accept the drainage more than any other plant, for example. So this grows in desert wash circumstances, and it likes a soil that's very coarse and quick draining. Coarse, quick draining soil. That's really a given good soil for almost all of our natives. Coarse and quick draining, okay? Now, considering that, let me tell you about a technique that I had to use for planting this plant. This plant, does anybody know what this plant is? Is it Matilija? No, it's not Matilija. Similar color though. This guy grows rampant along the foothills from say Glendora all the way to Ontario. This is Ancelia farinosa, it's called brittle bush. Brittle bush. There's two varieties. There's an Ancelia californica and this Ancelia farinosa. The californica has green leaves and this one has the silver leaves. Now, I know from experience that this plant in the summertime will look like hell, excuse my language, if it gets too wet. So if this receives overhead watering in the summertime, in the heat, it's gonna look bad. So I had to cut off all the water over here while we were establishing this and some of my other babies, right? Now, do you think it looks okay? Do you think it made it through? Yes, I'm absolutely, absolutely pleased with this. In fact, she could have looked really ratty by this time. How was I watering it? Under here, with my application of the watering can, right? Pretty close to the root ball, just to make sure that that got a little drink and then gradually out. But I tried not to moisten any of the leaves here. Why? This moist leaf, moisture on this leaf, this kind of uh, texture and color of leaf, it just burned it and it would wither it. And this would be infected with the leaf. So I had to water this very strategically by hand, again like I explained. But there's something else I did. Because this went in late and I was afraid for this particular plant, because I know its habit of looking just like hell, it's not established correctly. When I dug the hole for the root ball, my volunteers and I took handfuls of Pumice, little bits of pumice, handfuls of it, and we threw it in the planting hole. Why, right? I can pour on water there, and I know that water is going through quickly, okay? The drainage is as sharp as I can make it, meaning that water is in and out. The roots are getting their drink, and then that water is escaping. That's what I want. I do not want these guys sitting in moist circumstances any time in the summer. 
So when do you think I'm watering? I'm watering as early as I am here in the morning. And I start at six, so sometimes I'm here before, before it's even light. And where am I? I'm busy watering over here before the sun comes up, okay? So she can get her drink and a nice moisture, right? It's draining as sharp as I can make it, so in and out, and she still gets water. Now the danger, again, would be her sitting in moist soil or me watering too late in the day, and she would not be looking as good. So, has this taken extra work to establish? Absolutely, okay? Would I recommend this plant to everybody? No. <laughs> I love the way it looks, and it was a challenge for me to make this work. So if somebody were really interested, I'd have to tell them that whole story. Otherwise, there are some really easy plants that you don't have to go to this extreme. And again, at the end of today, I will remind you that on this listserv, I'm gonna give you like a dirty dozen to start, the basic ones that you cannot fail with, okay? I wanna talk about one other concept. Let's move into shade though. Let's go this way, because I'm gonna show you the other, oh wait, before we depart, memorize what this desert willow looks like. The only pruning I did was on the street side, just opening up the architecture of the bottom of the tree, okay? I love trees, and I like to look at this part of the tree, okay? So I kind of made a little view for the viewer to appreciate the architecture of the tree underneath. That's the only pruning. I, I didn't take anything from the top. I didn't reduce the, the interior at all. Now, I want to show you our second desert willow where I did do some extreme pruning, and you can see the difference. It will grow about another 50% higher. So I'd say about 12 feet tall and about 15 foot wide. Um, you know what? They'll stay low if I, if I don't reduce them. Right. 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 This plant, this is. This is the Cianothus right here. We all know the, the it's, you know, I hate the name uh, California Lilac. <laughs> I grew up in Ohio where there were real lilacs, so to say California Lilac, and it short shrifts this plant, I think, because Cianothus are glorious plants. So this is Dark Star. This is a particular variety. Really, really dark, intense blue. And the leaves are incredibly small in form, too. So great plant, too. It's incredibly happy here. Nitrogen Fixer. See, note this our nitrogen fixer. So that's adding nitrogen, good, good stuff to your soil. Okay, because I can talk about over here. But let's let's come back to our main focus here. This is my other desert willow here, Chilopsis linearis, right? Maybe at first gaze or first glance, they look similar enough, right? But then when you really start inspecting it, you can tell that. I cut up a lot of the branches, right? It's a lot more streamlined and slimmer down below, a lot more airier. And I've reduced a lot of the branches out of the interior. Mm -hmm. In fact, every time I go at that tree, I swear I take out 30% wow. of the material, 30%. And I know a lot of gardeners who are scared, scared, scared to prune. They just don't, they won't prune their own trees. I have a dear, you guys even know her, some of you, Lee Adams, who works in this garden too, right? Lee said, John, I need you to come over and prune my fruit trees. I just can't do it. <laughs> she can't do it. And I understand, I get it, right? But I am just like, oh, give me a pruning shears. I love to prune and I love to watch what happens in a tree over time. And if you're into pruning, you can actually see your work over time, right? You remember when you started about making a tree happen like this too. You can look back at your work, right, as if you designed the tree. And I, I, I gain a lot of joy in, in doing oh, that to a tree. Oh, beautiful praying mantis. Wow, that's oh, a big lovely. One. Wow. Look at big guy. Yeah, she's big. <laughs> look at those beautiful wings. I thought it was a grasshopper. Wow, that's huh? great. We have an egg case in the garden already, we've seen too, for the praying mantis. Great garden habitat companion, right? Lovely. Yes. I think they're do the they, biggest insect predator. Do they um, have an outer skeleton that they shed, or was the thing hanging on my screen a dead thing? It could have been a dead thing. Um, yeah, yeah, I don't think they good. shed them. I don't think so. <laughs> That's what I was wondering. Right. I was hoping it hadn't died, but we all have to. So when this tree, this when this tree went in, actually, my boss, 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 Richard Schulhoff, who was CEO of the of the arboretum, he said, John. I have no problem with that tree, except I don't want it interrupting sight lines. 
sight lines. And what he was thinking about was the approach to our crescent from this roadway, right? So he, his notion was, I'm okay with a tree being there, but make sure you reduce it as much as possible always so that people can either see through it, see over it, or see around it. So I knew that was my challenge. So that's all he had to say. And I have my pruning shears and I love to prune and experiment. So like I said, every time I'm in that tree, reducing it by about 30%. Does she care? Not at all, right? This, this tree can absolutely take that kind of pruning. In fact, I would dare say I would never do this, but I would dare say that if I took her all the way down to about 12 inches, she'd probably regenerate. Wow. That's, it's, you know, Willows in general, although she's not really a willow, but acts like a willow, willows in general will re-sprout just as easy. In fact, you could probably propagate some of her branches too. I've never tried it, but it's probably that, that easy. A lot of the plants that actually their original circumstances were along washes, they have the ability to be uprooted, thrown downstream in a flood, pushed into a corner, and then they re-root, right? Which makes total sense, right? That's the kind of plant that would live along flooded circumstances, right? It can't buy, it can't think, and I'm going to be here forever, right? It gets moved around and pushed around. So they, they, they oh, produce no, roots no, back. No. I think we'll let you spot. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good, okay. Oh, I know, what? <laughs> Sounds like a cartoon. <laughs> Give me a safe spot. Sorry, sweetie. So the flea circus comedy sketch that we ever seen. I've never seen one fan out as uh, like yeah. that too. That's cool. Yeah. So anyway, that's been reduced and can be reduced very easily, right? As far as the pruning. Again, the same flower color, the burgundy. Yes, sir. Does that have to be in full sun, or can it be in partial shade? It can be in partial shade, but it is shade. Yes, it could take some. I would. I, if that's your only choice, I would try it. Because I, I would try it. It certainly, it may not look as much, uh, it may not have, be as full of flowers eventually, but yeah, I would give it a whirl. All right. Now, plants of the crescent, right? This is what this talk is about. I have to make mention for what's behind me in this glorious red, right? This is amaranth, and this, is what, this was the grain that fed the indigenous peoples up and down this hemisphere before they hybridized corn. Which you know from your history, food history especially, the indigenous people took thousands of years to move corn to the size ear that we're used to today. The original food crop was Teosintle, which is a Nahuatl or an Aztec term for the original corn variety. And it was only as big as my finger, and the ears were teeny, 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 right? No way was that going to be the staple food for anybody. <laughs> so it took millennia, millennia for that to be developed. In fact, just this summer, they discovered a new cache of petrified corn in Honduras, and they labeled that as 4,000 years old. So we know that 4,000, I think it was? Yeah, 4,000. They, they started having corn of a durable size to be a staple food. But prior to that, what did people survive on? This grain right here, amaranth. It's one of the most protein-rich grains. It's teeny, jet, shiny black, about the size of a poppy seed. The grain is cooked. It's also popped like little tiny microscopic popcorn. It's made into flour. It's also, I think, fermented into different things too. The greens are eaten and they taste like a really, really potent, rich spinach. And the best greens are new greens, right? Baby greens. There are different varieties of that, of this, different colors, different statures. Some are grown for the leaves, some are grown for the grain. The grain comes in different colors, black, blonde, even pink, I think. So this monster plant is just one season's worth of growth, right? Oh, yeah. The seeds actually came from my garden. I brought them in and our toddlers who help uh, volunteer in the garden were the ones who planted it. So in like two weeks, they were walking among these plants that were taller than <laughs> them, right? So they got a charge out of how fast this stuff grew. It's been a showstopper as people wander across here thinking, what the heck is that? So. <laughs> We've had such a show stopping of this, it's become so popular, we decided that this corridor is going to be our highlighting of ancient food plants. Ancient food plants. So there we are starting with our first candidate of the amaranth too. So we have another couple of interesting things and last year we had rainbow corn too. So we had rainbow jam corn, so it was a special heirloom variety that we planted. 
So we are going to actually next year plant Teo Simple, the original, the original species of, that corn came from too, so people can see them up close. And I can keep talking about the story with the kids, right? Do you know where corn comes from? Do you know how small it used to be? So that's etc. So believe it or not, the other, the bad part of this story is that the Spanish forbade people from growing this and eating it. So it was actually outlawed by the church because it was considered too important a part of their culture and it was considered a sacred plant. So somebody smashed that whole notion for a while, but we know what it is and, and, and the part it played during its time too. So that's part of the story too. It was actually forbidden to be planted for a while too. There's a lot more story too, but that's that's the juice. How do you harvest the seed? Right. I will show you. Oh. Just ready now. So on Tuesday, we're going to harvest. Oh my God. I know. It's tons. There's so much grain out of each plant. I'm going to bring my winnowing baskets. Do you know what a winnowing basket is? I have a big, wide straw disc of a basket. I have two of them. And we're going to winnow these on Tuesday. So, so is that ready to eat? Well, you could cook it. You have to cook it. Yeah, I know. Right, yes, it's ready. It's ready. But Absolutely do you have ready. to dry it? After? No, it's dry now. Oh, okay. It's dry now. So yep. it's the black part that's yep, the, the black part. edible or yes, the exactly. replanting part. Yes. Could you eat it dry, uh, just like that, like poppy seeds? I don't seeds know. It's like chia seeds. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Can you eat this too? No, that, that, that becomes irritating actually. The drier it gets, it's kind of pokey. Like it'll mm. get stuck in your hand. So. You definitely don't want to eat that. So but funny. you know what? I just bit through the seed and it was soft enough to actually eat. So I was, I'm wondering, you could throw these on a muffin probably. Nobody would know the difference. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but it's super rich in protein and lysine yeah. and I think iron actually. But it's one of the only vegetables with, with so much lysine in it. Tomatoes I think do too, right? So that's an extra. You know they sell it as sprout? Yes. Yes. I buy yes. them all the time. Yes. Yeah. In fact, the price is dropping on amaranth now because it's gaining in popularity. Yeah. It used to be really super expensive to buy it by the pound, but I'm seeing that the, the price is lowering now because more and more people are eating it. You know, if you go to your granola snack bars or your top quality mm -hmm. of that or your mix, you're going to see amaranth in the list. Mm -hmm. probably. So right now, I can. it's the time to plant it, right? Okay, planting. Here's a curious thing too. These ideally want the hottest part of the season. These guys love the, the, the highest, hottest part of the summer. Mm -hmm. And actually to be just doused with as much water as you want to give them. Okay, so think monsoon. These guys love monsoon. They behave this way. However, they can be planted in different times of the year. They just will not achieve this ginormous height. And they may or may not flower successfully. They'll have something. It may just be a real, just the finger size of a of a flower thing. So, I have I have actually uh, uh, sown these in the fall about this time, and it'll get oh maybe 12 inches, okay. and I can still eat the leaves, but it will do no larger because okay. it doesn't have the solar hours. Mm -hmm. But and they will self seed too. These will self seed. So the best time to plant it what April? Yes. Yes. And it, this will die back. Yes. Yep, the whole thing will die back. And you saw how <laughs> they're actually all flopped over on a piece of bamboo that I laid laterally, right? Otherwise, they would be just as tall as that other one that, that made it. Uh -huh. In my garden, they're actually that tall because I can I prop them up and, and I talk to them. But I'm not here every day to talk <laughs> to these to guys. Yes, yeah, sing to them. Yeah. I whistle at them. My dog does too. <laughs> yes, so these guys are all flopped over. <laughs> Uh -huh. So these are flopped over. So when they die, you just chop and drop? Uh, we can. Drop However, this is so. these seeds are so potent, I'm going to make sure all these flower heads are out because I don't want too many babies <laughs> on there. But so, so this is California native, low, no. low water. So, so it, how this fit in the concept? Great question. That's, what, that's why I, I, the caveat is we're talking about plants on the crescent. So I have to talk about this one because it's such a big draw. Mm -hmm. But it's not in the same uniform categories that our drought tolerant plants are. So Your this water. is an exception. This benefited from extra water. However, it could have grown in very droughty circumstances too. I mean, this, these amaranth got no more water than this chalopsis did. 
so you can see how they performed, right? Mm -hmm. That's a lot of performance from pretty little water, but but we didn't not give it water. So it did get it did get a sufficient supply of water to make that happen. Again, we're going to continue growing vegetables on this platform here on this terrace. So it's an evolving process and I'll probably be talking about the caveat on how much water is here compared to the other areas because they're vegetables and food. But again, like I showed you that book in the beginning, the selection of what vegetables also becomes a question. Which vegetables can tolerate that aridity? Which vegetables can tolerate a week of 110 degrees in Arcadia, right? Not everything can tolerate that. So that Gary Nabon book is crucial in that regard. Amaranth is that flexible. It loves that heat. So there's no problem with that. And if it missed some watering, it may it may wilt, but it'll be perk right back up. So it's it's flexible in that regard. Absolutely. Okay, let's wander up and I want to talk about some of our turf alternatives, okay? Our our lawn alternatives to which is an important part of our garden. So we're gonna wind up this path and stay to the right. And this harks back to one of the original notions for us creating this acre of uh, landscape. The impetus was to encourage, again, the, the public to know more and more about how they can convert to drought-tolerant landscape in general with all the variety. But for that gardener or that homeowner that likes the uniformity of a lawn, they still want something looking mono lawn, right? So what can I do instead, right? What can I what can I bring to my landscape? This has been one of our most talked about candidates here, right? And though there's some negatives to this in a second I'll talk about, this has performed way beyond our expectations. This is Phila not a flora. And its trademark name that I told you like Kleenex is called Carapia. And I have some literature over there on the table about it from the distributor, from the maker. The curious thing was, this was a kind of cultivar in a way, but it was hybridized. So it was actually manipulated in a laboratory from the original species, which is a verbena. Everybody's heard of verbenas, right? There's a lot of kind of verbena. You can see up close, if you look very close at these white flowers, they mimic the verbena. That's where you'll say, oh, I recognize that flower form. There's some purple verbenas, sand verbenas, there are garden verbenas. Same class of family. That's why these flowers look the way they do. That's why they attract scores of bees, mainly honeybees when they're in bloom. But look at this ground cover, right? Look at this matting, right? This matting is entirely thick, like six inches thick. I can plunge my hand in there, right? It's just matted on top of each other continually. Now I'm sitting in a lower portion, if you notice, right? This portion right here around me, it looks lower than the rest of this mat. Let me describe what happened. We have gophers on this landscape, and many of you have gophers at home, right? We have lots of gophers on this landscape. It keeps the coyotes busy. <laughs> And I encounter them over in this landscape in the dark when I arrive here in the morning because they're after the gophers. We had gophers run through this carapia, the Philonautiflora, underneath it. And we couldn't figure out why was this dying in patches. For example, if you look at this gray carapia, right? I'm thinking, what's going on in here? And I kept pulling it out and pulling it out until I was down to the ground. Don't worry, I'm going to have to do this anyway. So it's not just for you guys. So I'm going to actually do this. But I'm pulling this away and I'm noticing all of this is dead, right, for the most part. And it looks bad under here. In fact, it's all ratty. What's going on? This has been undermined by gopher. But I didn't know that at the time. I thought, what the heck's going on? So we dug with my volunteers. We cut all this out, dug it up, and we found gopher tunnels under it. So I thought, uh-huh. The gophers are undermining the rootage in this spot, right? So everything above it is dying because they're undermining the roots or eating them. Who knows, either or. So we dug all this up in its bad patch and then we took pitchforks, not to destroy the gopher, but to destroy their tunnels, right? I didn't see any gophers, I like gophers. But we destroyed their tunnels, collapsed the tunnels with the pitchfork and then we let that, that naked soil be for a second because I thought, hmm, I'm gonna have to root some of this to propagate it to fill in that blank, right? This is the area I'm talking about right here. Three weeks ago, three weeks ago, four weeks ago, this was naked soil. 
Look at how fast this stuff came back, mm. right? That's what this stuff is capable of doing, right? You see it's lower than the rest of it, right? Because this was naked soil just four weeks ago. Mm. So this is the first layer of the carapia, the philonautiflora, to take over this naked soil. And I don't even see any soil available anymore. Bang! It's no covered up. No replanting there. Didn't plant anything. The curious thing was, these actually regenerated from the original plugs, the original rosettes of plugs. Even though we had pitchforked this, we did not destroy the original plug. And I couldn't even see it. I didn't even see it there anymore. But that plug of root was so durable, it outlasted the gophers and our pitchforks and came back like this. Is this maximum height? Is it what? The maximum height? Yes. Actually, right along the edge there, there's a, there's a row of logs. But you can't tell because the carapia has totally eaten the logs. So the maximum height is about right here. Then. This, is, this is it right here. It continues to, to grow on top of each other laterally. I see no verticality to the growth. It continues laterally. So yes. how much water? How much water? Good question. This is actually gets too much water in our landscape. Because this mat is so dense, if I plunge my finger in here, the soil is still moist. It should not be moist, mm. right? But it is because this is so humid. So this is so dense, so matted. This particular plant needs less water than my other panels. But they're all on the same irrigation system. So this one is feeling moister than the other ones, Gia. Just because it's so thick. Uh huh. You didn't have to? Didn't have to what? Water? By hand? No, no. It was just the overhead. We have the overhead irrigation on oh, this area. Okay. Yes. Okay. Excuse me, I should, I should have uh, announced that. We're no longer in the hand watering establishing. These guys have been in years already. This is on a regular throw out, the pop up, throw the water across the uh, MP rotators. And I have those on twice a week again for 40 minutes. But you know, according to the water law, we can't do that. We can only water 10 minutes. Right. You know what? And that's right. That's right. There's some explanation that needs clarified between the city and... and because it's the, the nature of our delivery equipment. Mm -hmm. I know. I know. And that's what... Mandy actually is here from Arcadia, too. And she and I have conversations about that. So everyone can be on the same page. Because it has to do with what, what delivery system are you using? Correct. Right. And a summer, you 10 minutes, you, you only have a 30 minutes. But right. your issue cycle is 40 minutes, and two days come out 80 minutes. Right. So which is mean you are getting almost great time among the water while I'm watering. Well, it's not the amount, though. The, the, the actual amount of water is not the same because of the delivery of it happening slower. So the timing looks more. So. So they have done a study where they compare the different kinds of sprinkling. Yeah. So it's about 10 minutes is the same as 40 minutes. Right. Right. It depends on because because the the older systems will use the same amount of water in a shorter time. So we are okay to do that for John. For <laughs> John. No, don't put my name on that. <laughs> no, we actually have to figure that out come next summer again. I mean that's. You know, we're all learning together as including facilities and institutions, right? Including Arcadia Water. They, and they've been here and they're learning about our devices that we're running. We're, we're, try, we're trying in this landscape to stay right up front in technology. Like, okay, this is the best system yet. It delivers slower. There's no, our system that our overheads throw no mist. There's no mist floating out in the, in the air, right? A lot of our old, um, What's it called? The rainbirds. They <coughs> throw their sprinkler, and then a lot of mist just floats along that water. But we have none of that. What Every one of them is a drop. What is the name of the creature? They're a hunter. Hunter is the maker. That's the, the maker of the system, and they're called MP rotators. MP rotators. Yep. I can I add that to the list, sir. <coughs> so, Carapia um, is uh, Philonautiflora. This was actually created in a laboratory at UC Davis. UC Davis Laboratory, and it is expensive. Some people bought it and they said, oh my God, I can't believe how expensive it is. It is. 
people are trying to pay for their graduate school, I think. <laughs> so they're charging for having developed this in a laboratory at UC Davis. So that's, that's and it's, it's available by very few distributors because it's in a very tight, controlled distribution, okay? That said, I'll share a little secret with you. <laughs> Once you have some in your garden, it's really easy to propagate. Oh, so it roots so at every node along the stem, oh, right. okay? Mm -hmm. Obviously, that's what it's doing out here, right? So you can take advantage of that. And again, a little insider, I should not be saying this and I'll deny that I even said it, <laughs> but <jump>. order less, <laughs> order less order than less. they tell you. Okay? Now what if the gophers so, come back? If the gophers come back, you know that you can rip it out. It'll still come back. It'll so, I mean, still just, come back, right? Yeah, yeah. So why do you like gophers? Because they're cute. <laughs> <laughs> and actually, they keep, I like the coyotes, so and they keep too, the vet. I know, I know. What, what I about know. maintenance? You mow this once a year? That's a great question. Thank you, you for bringing that up. This is mowable. We have not mowed it, mown it yet. It is mowable. At this point, it's been in so long, and it's so thick and dense. If I mowed it, I'd have divots out of it. So. I would have had to have mowed it from the beginning. So if you if you do have plans to keep it super low and you want it maintained, another reason for mowing it is to chop off the flower heads. Mm. Which, if you have dogs that are allergic or you have grandchildren or whatever in, that are allergic, maybe you want to get rid of the flower heads, take a lawnmower over it and mm. decapitate the flower heads. I would even think a push those old real style mowers would, would work well on this. Too. Now again, ours has not been mown, and ours is, you know, very bumpily. I wouldn't even mow it now. It would probably look too bad. Is it two years worth of here? Yeah, two years. I know, two years. And yeah. we planted them eight, eight inches on center, I think, each plug, originally. You could double that space. Now, now in prepping, did you rip out all the weeds? Or if you've got a, a problem yard where weeds are going to come up in the spring, can you lay that down and it'll grow so dense it'll smother them? Yes, but in the meantime, you have to get those weeds out. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, I do have so to question was about weeds. These will inundate the weeds and push out weeds, but while this is getting established, rooting out and spreading, keep a handle on the weeds. Okay. Yes. This, this grass is popping over here. Right. Right. You've got good questions. <laughs> You're going to call me on everything. <laughs> no, this is, a, this is an interesting peculiarity that we went into. We had planted in this panel, before it was gazanias, which it is now, we planted California native grasses, cool season grasses, mix from Stover seeds, okay? Planted it out in this panel, and then we had this huge rain right after it. And guess what? All the seed washed everywhere. It washed down there, off the surface. Yep, exactly. Closest to this panel, guess where it landed? Mixed in with this carafia. Mind you, I don't know why, but the grasses, these native grasses are the ones that poke through the best. So they continue to poke through, and I'm not too upset because they are native grass and they look great, and who cares? Not too bad, but, and it's not as weedy looking as something else. I dare say that not a lot of any other herbaceous weeds would probably made it through here. Probably just the grass, just the grass. But thank you for pointing that out, because this is remnant of the error that we made over here that we could not generate. They landed over here instead. So these are native grasses like Stipa or Nacella. These are good guys too, right? I love those grasses, yeah. So that's Carapia, big success. Expensive, don't pay for too much of it. <coughs> and we'll just, we'll just wander down this strip and I'll talk about each one of these very quickly. Right? Here's another plant of our crescent. We chose this one on purpose because a lot of people know what this is. They've seen it, they've seen it along the freeway, they've seen it in people's landscapes, they've seen it at the gas station growing on the corner, right? In fact, some people call this freeway daisy. They're gazanias, they're from South Africa originally. So we wanted something in here that people would say, oh, I recognize that, I can do that. So that we wanted a panel of something very accessible and recognizable. However, we tried to choose a color that was a little more interesting probably remember a lot of them come in yellow. yellow and there's some really fancy ones copper king and the like with variegated uh, coppery yeah. burgundy colors it's gorgeous cute. they're fun flowers this one though we wanted to mimic and pick up the color on some of our signage so we picked this tangerine color so it's pretty uniform in that respect we had some fits and starts with this the peacocks were really <laughs> harassing these little babies so 
we still have some that are uh, that are being uh, uh, harassed and undermined by you know what. So we won't talk about it too much over here because I, I don't know what to do. <laughs> so we've lost some up front, but you can see where it's where it's been robust. It looks great. And it, again, very very little water. Totally no maintenance, right? I don't bother removing seed heads or anything. It's just let it go. <laughs> about that in a second. We have piloted a scrappy recycled technique of soil preparation here in the Crescent called lasagna mulching or cardboard mulching or sheet mulching. All the above. Same technique. We literally use brown cardboard laid over our surfaces, moistened, and then layered with mulch on top. Cardboard, right? Cardboard squelches your weed bank right? Robbing them of any kind of photosynthesis. The cardboard breaks down over time, so it adds great texture to the soil, because it's paper. And above that, and more even weirdly esoteric, the glue in the cardboard acts as food for the mycorrhizae, the mycelium, the fungus that we need in our arid landscape. That fungus, the mycelium, feeds off the glue in our cardboard, believe it or not. So it bumps up the start of that mycorrhizae. And what I'm talking about, and I see people shaking their heads, if you've ever dug into your garden and you see this web of white, lacy material, right? It looks like snowflakes almost, and they're all, that's the mycelium. That's the network of fungus that is providing a network of transporting moisture and nutrients to plants across your landscape. Curiously, my growing up in Ohio in my grandma's vegetable garden, every year we took that big machine called a rototiller and chopped up the soil to plant our tomatoes and cucumbers and zucchini and okra. You're not supposed to do that. Why? Because you're ripping through those mycelium. Those mycelium are a network of sustenance, of nurture and nutrition. Today we know that you want to do as little of that interruption as possible. So when you're digging in your landscape, we used to dig up the whole garden and say, oh, doesn't that look good? You don't want to do that anymore. Dig up where it's necessary only because those structures are providing a very important security system to the longevity of your landscape, let's put it that way. Yes, yes. It could be much more fragile in that place. Yeah. Yeah. What kind of mulch? Good question. We use everything that we can get our hands on. And a lot of this is just, this, this big chunky material was generated right here on the Arboretum on site. Okay, so, so we use the debris that we can access at the debris pile at the north end of the Arboretum. If you've ever been up there, piles of stuff. So I love it. We have a lot to choose from. You saw that I used the grass over there on that slope, right? I'm going to show you where this grass came from in a second. It's right next to us. Okay, that's what I use. So grass material. If it's any of our native material that I've been pruning, that's safe to use as mulch too. I've even used eucalyptus leaves and the like, which you want to go, what? No, no, no. <laughs> but I use it in ways that I know it's not going to interrupt any of our growth. But, but when you put the cardboard, you put compost or mulch? Okay, good question. When you put the cardboard on and back to this lasagna or sheet mulching, it depends on which direction I'm going. If I know that I'm going to be growing food or fruit trees, then I'm, I know I'm going to be putting on organic material like compost. I can. I can put composty soil on top of my cardboard. And I can plant right into that new soil at the top. Or, if it's not deep enough, I can pierce a hole through the cardboard and there's my planting hole. Right? Where it's surrounded by cardboard, but enough for you to be able to water it, right? Like we talked about it. Maybe you open up the cardboard. But the rest of it is all covered with cardboard except where you're planting. Now that's with organic -y soil matter. If I know I'm just in the in-between, between my landscape, woody mulch right here, no compost, just woody mulch on top. And I'm not even putting water on this. I'll just like cover it and let it go. And it's good. It'll, it'll stay always cooler and semi-moist and underneath that cardboard, guarantee there's gonna be some moisture no matter what, no matter what. How deep is your we like three, three inches is what we always say. When we're doing a new thing, like I just described with the cardboard, three inches of material on top, be it soil or the mulch. 
that's a good good fact. And then that re needs renewed every couple of years or so. I've, I've had a couple of problems. First of all, 10 years ago I did it. I want everybody to hear your question. 10 years ago I did it and was very successful. Uh -huh. With the cardboard? Yeah, I okay. had a, a lawn full of weeds, pulled it all out in a strip. Okay. Lay down the cardboard, lay down the mulch, planted things, and um, I have pictures if anybody wants to see. Okay. This year, I was going to redo some areas, and I laid down the cardboard and I laid down the mulch, and within two weeks, the raccoons dug it all out. We got the same Oh, I was so angry. Right. right. Also, I'm taking a class through Mount Sac for uh -huh. seniors. Uh -huh. And I told him about it, and I said, well, I'm going to use this cardboard to do my backyard now. And he said, it's too late. You should have done it in August, because then it'll kill the weeds. Now you'll lay it down, and the weeds will come up through it. Is that true? Come up through it. No, I wouldn't think that okay. that's true. All right, then no. I'll go ahead and try it. No, because it's going to take... Get it. <laughs> well, the raccoons are probably after those grubs, the exactly. big beetle that's grubs. Exactly, that's what I was assuming right. was happening. And those grubs are coming coming closer to the surface now, the cardboard there, because exactly. it's moisture and, and, nice and because and no. when I did it the first time, I'm sure my, my soil was much healthier. So I'm right. getting more grubs, so yes. they're getting more... I literally exactly. saw up my um, liquid amber tree, like a totem pole, Four raccoons at night, <laughs> looking down at my cat, saying, "Get out of here! We want to have we want dinner." Our grubs. Yeah. Right, right, right. Yeah. No, that's okay. That's well, funny. that's good to know yeah. that I can go ahead and do it because I, yes. I want to do it. No, yeah. no, do it. I, I don't think you have weeds. The only weeds there. you might see germinate is in that very top layer, just because there's weed seed in there, maybe. Yeah. I mean, sometimes we spend good money here and we actually buy, buy soil from Cowblend and have it brought yeah. in here because we know it's going to be weed-free. You know, they guarantee it's a gardening mix, et cetera, rather than trying to move soil from on site here at the Arboretum, where I might have a seed bank. Yeah. So yeah, if I absolutely blend. need it, clean cow blend. Cow blend is organic? You can buy organic soil from them, I think. We use, we use a composty uh, organic, I don't, I don't think it's organic. It's a compost garden soil. I don't know if they, could, they call it organic or not. My, so my mulch is all the leaf trash from my golden medallion and my ash tree, okay. which covered that should be all right a huge amount yeah that should be plus, as long as it's nice and dry those leaves yeah. yeah plus when they were cutting trees around in our neighborhood i asked uh, the cutters to leave a pile in my nice. driveway nice oh yeah 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 i know the more mulch the better always yeah we're gonna march down i'll talk about the last couple panels if you're if you're happy to be in the shade you can just sit there and stay if you like but I'll try to talk loud too. How much time do we have? 10 minutes. Australian favorites, there are two right here. Many people know this plant already. This actually is uh, available at um, Armstrong as we speak. This is a Grevillea. Grevillea is a big class of, uh, of plants from Australia. Some are trees that are 200 foot tall. Others are creeping small shrubs. This one is called Spectabilis, I think it is. I'll send you the name too. It's a cultivar, right? Off of a certain Grevillea. Plants it for its gorgeous color. It's pretty got no, it's pretty much non-stop blooming all year actually. So this is a great candidate. And it does bring in the, the hummingbirds. This has been in the garden only two years from a gallon container. Wow. And I swear it was only this big when we put it in. So very happy, fast growing. This is its maximum size right here, no bigger. This is Mariana Cetifolia, curly blue bush, and I'll send you the name. This one is being piloted by the Arboretum. It used to be very difficult to acquire. More and more now, it is acquirable, especially in uh, nurseries that specialize in Australian plants. This is actually related to spinach. It's a chinopodiaceae, a chinopod. Is so that, that uh, You know what? I don't know. I don't know. But, it's the same family that our amaranth is in. Mm -hmm. The amaranth, spinach, quinoa, they're all chinopodiaceae, including this baby. This is from a very trying circumstance in Australia. I was poking around researching this plant and I went to Wikipedia and I found some photos of this. It grows as a monoculture across the landscape in Australia. This is the only thing growing mm. and it's totally forlorn, dry. Ugh. So this is very, very, very hardy guy, right? Especially in this circumstance here. So it's used to very trying circumstances. And 
it's more and more acquirable. People like this. It's got a fleshy leaf, right? You can see that there's two forms of it, though. Another of my experiment, I showed you the desert willow, two pruning um, techniques. <laughs> These have been pruned. The ones on the other side of the path that are more vertical have not been pruned at all. So you can see that I'm trying to experiment with the form. I'm learning about this plant. I don't have experience with it, so I'm pruning it and watching what happens, like how tight she remains, how, it, how easy it is to form any kind of a shape on purpose. So, so far I'm kind of like so, this. So this result. will propagate? I have no idea how this propagates. <laughs> Whether it, I, I doubt that she's going to, I, I haven't even seen flowers on this to be honest. So I've seen no seeds. She's not coming up anywhere beyond where she was planted. You know, it's a really woody stem about this thick on each of these babies. So they've been in uh, two years, two plus years, two or three years. But you can see those are untrimmed over there. If you go online and look for pictures, you'll see that they look really lanky like that. They remind me of our uh, Artemisia, the Tridentata, the Great Basin Sage, if you know that plant. It's not really a sage, it's an Artemisia. That's what they remind me of. Okay, so we have our two Australians here. This is another Ceanothus, a great Ceanothus, nitrogen fixer, great flowers. Again, one of these plants that you would say, oh, I want the drama in my garden. This is loaded in lovely tiny blue flowers in the late winter, early spring, as are all Ceanothus. And Ceanothus come in a variety of statures and architecture, small shrubs and trees to this, this prostrate ground cover looking Ceanothus as well, okay? And shades of blues and pinks. Okay, behind us is where I got this thatch grass that I laid on the hillside over there that I was talking about as the mulch. This is carex. This is a sedge. It is not a grass. This is native California material. It's very happy here. The only problem with it for me, in my estimation, is a little bit of a patchiness. And guess why that might be happening? Hello. Right, my friend's in here too. But where this is nice and lush, and, and untouched by our friend right there, it looks great. So this is its look right here. Can this be mown? Yes, it can be mown. Can it be thatched and all the beige straw colored grass be pulled out of it? Yes, that can also be done. Can I forget about it and not do anything to it? Yes, absolutely. This is totally carefree. Will this take abuse? Absolutely, this is like indestructible. Will this creep out into other areas of my garden? Yes. <laughs> okay, so be careful. Is it easy to remove when you sp start to see the new growth? No. Oh, okay. No, and I was just gonna get to that because oh. this path over here that's supposed to be the boundary between these two panels, guess what we were doing on uh, yesterday, on Friday? Mm -hmm. Trying to weed out the, and you can't tell because we did a pretty good job, but this stuff creeps through the brick. You can oh, see it through okay. the brick and then up on the other side. And these are rhizomes, so they're underground stems with these pokey uh, shoots, right? And they are pokey, and you'll have to get under, under, underneath there yeah, and rip those rhizomes out. out. You have no. to get off. That sounds like all disadvantages, right? But if you had a scrappy corner in your landscape, just put one of these guys in and let it go to town. It'll, it'll fill that area in, it'll keep it green, moist, and provide habitat. If you know your insects, then we have a giant sphinx moth, the pink striped sphinx moth. It loves this material. I've seen it burrowing inside of this carex, the sphinx moth. So it actually it provides habitat for that glorious moth. So that's carex, sedge. And I'll write down the name and send it on the list there. All right, down here. And I know we have five minutes, so I'll just talk <laughs> over here and then we'll gather back up in the shade and make sure everybody's signed up for the Vista. Okay, there's a variety of stuff right here at the last. First of all, that's our flower meadow. The flower meadow has been a big hit this year. Plants of the Crescent, it has become part of the Crescent because of its popularity. It is an anomaly in our landscape, just like our vegetables over, over there were, because there's more water on this section than anywhere else to provide that constant flower show, okay? 
the flowers that you see in there are mostly non-native, but they're regionally, regionally, adjacently native. So we're talking the Central America, the Mexican Peninsula for some of the cosmos. So some of them are, and some of them are from alpine circumstances in Northern California. So it's a mix of semi-appropriate flowers. So that said, I'm not going to talk about that again. We're going to do a whole workshop just on our meadow later in the season. So sign up for that if you're interested. We'll talk about seeding and providing the right circumstance for a meadow in your garden. I'm standing in another panel, and though it's not as showy per se right now, this is one of my favorites. This is, you may recognize this, normally what you happen on are the white flowering variety of this, which is the standard species. This is a cultivar. Somebody said, oh my God, look, there's a yarrow in this weird red color, like the color of paprika. So guess what the cultivar name is? Paprika. So this is a red version of our yarrow, Y-A-R-R-O-W. It's Achillea millifolium. And this one's called paprika because of the color. This is a great plant and it can take abuse, some walking, it can take a lawnmower. There's a lawn of this at the Lummis House off the 110 at Avenue 43. It's got a native landscape around that historic site. There's a yarrow lawn that's been there for about 15 or 20 years, and it still looks good. And it's all made of yarrow. People walk across it all the time, and they don't know what they're walking on. Because it's walked on all the time over there, the plant remains really low and close to the ground, but it stays a lot, right? Does it flower? Yes, and it still flowers, but sometimes it's right along the ground because it can't achieve a stem, right? You can see what our stems are doing. Obviously, nobody's walking across these to crush them. Right? But you could walk across this if you needed to. We don't, so they're a little larger. There's some in-between spaces that have been interrupted by either you know who or whatever. We had some problem with the soil at this very part of our garden too. It was very, very, very compacted. So we're not surprised that there's been not so much uh, success down here as part of the garden. Do you know, it, you know if you can use this for a mode Yes, you can. Yeah. Like another one. Right, yes, you can use this one as well. Because it's just a fluke in the color. My son makes beer. Uh, beer? Yes. Yarrow beer. Nice. Oh, wow. <laughs> no, I know. You know, curiously, this plant is originally from Europe. It is naturalized over our entire planet to the point now where in some books you look this up and they call it a California native. But it's not. Its genetic origin is European. And its history with humans goes back to Neanderthal time. They have found fossilized pollen from yarrow in the Neanderthal grave site. So it's got a connection with humanity going back that far in our history. In medicinal use, medicinal and sacred use. So very curious. This is used in permaculture gardens at the foot and ringing fruit tree. It provides a lot of nutrition and... What's that? Mm -hmm. Part of the deal with the yes, yes, exactly. If you're planting yield, uh -huh. your food, food forest and your yield. Yeah. So a lot of times the fruit trees are ringed with this. It's a great plant for your edible garden as well. And we put this here as, a, as an alternative to turf. So if it's under a tree, then it would take shade? Yes. Yarrow actually does not mind shade, this guy. So that, that's a good thing. I, that's a good thing. I'm glad you spotted that. Because, you know, if anything, few of our plants are like, we like shade, right? We're always like, <laughs> sun, sun, sun. This will take shade. So how far apart from the tree do you plant? Or it can be really it can be to really them. close actually. I've seen I've seen the yarrow growing all over the, under the entire tree. Right. Right. So it's good for us. Yes. This last grass back here is one of my favorites. I know it sounds like everything I'm talking about is my favorite. It's true. But this one is really cool because we're designing the last bit of our crescent is gonna be about attracting native bees. So I've begun researching with all my book friends at home from our library about native bees. And because I'm out here watering in the morning, I have a tendency to notice what's going on in the garden on a microscopic level. Guess what I found in here? I've documented in my iPhone photographs five different kinds of native bees hanging on these flower heads that are now dried out in the morning. In the morning, right there. Oh, five species. Clearly, and one of them has not been identified yet by the entomologist at the Natural History Museum. Oh, yeah. So go figure. And I think, oh my God, we brought this in as a as a turf alternative, right? 
It is a California native grass. That's why it looks so robust. It looks a little brown right now because it's at the end of its season. And this is actually a summer grass. So this really looked its best in that stupid heat in the middle of the season. Which a lot of our native grasses, if you know about our grasses, a lot of them are the opposite. They look the best in the cool season, right? This one looks the best in the summer. So it's a nice foil for your other grasses. And I'll make a note of that on your listserv too, if you can remember. Can you, Did you mow this? Yes, you can mow it. However, this is a clumping grass. So there are actually clumps in here. So if I walked across this, I may trip because there's a clump of grass. So are you going to mow or? Here's what we're going to do. We're going to, because I have a multitude of hands <laughs> and high school kids, we're going to actually get in here and do this by hand. Oh my we're going to shear by hand. We actually have? sheared that entire carex patch by hand, too, <laughs> believe it or not. So I'm going to get down here. And this is another mention that I want to want you guys to be aware of. When your native grasses look bad, okay, again, back to the aesthetic, right? Ooh, I need to clean this up. It's too gray. It's too straw colored. It looks like it's dead. When it when it's that point, pretty much as a generalization, it's cool to take your shears and to grab this grass and to give it a haircut all the way back to the ground, almost. Okay, leaving a couple inches of the original base there. But I can take this entire top of it off, back down to two or three inches. Am I going to do that right now? Mm. I still like it and I know I saw my bees in here so I'm probably not going to do it until somebody really twists my arm but if this were in my landscape and I were trying to make a point absolutely pretty soon now I would shear this down do you get frost here yes we do get frost I had five frosts last year small light ones between uh, Christmas and New Year's yes. wow. can you grow this in pots so yes. you can have a little bee have, have, yes. habitat here and there yes in fact <laughs> There's one that reseeded by itself beyond our point south spreader right at the corner. One little plant reseeded by itself. So it grew in that little tight space between rocks. I know they will grow in pots. In fact, these would be spectacular in pots. It is, it is called Budaloa gracilis. Yes, blue grandma grass. Right there, it's got signage on it. But I'll write them down for you. Yeah. So this is a native California grass. Easy. And it actually spreads and reseeds by itself, too. And you can see how lovely it filled in this, this corridor, right? Again, though, if you didn't like all this, this beige material, now would be the time to scalp it down and to start fresh. And she will. She'll start fresh as soon as we start getting our regular rain. This gets just as little as all the other plants in the garden as far as water. So very, very minimal. Uh, we have other grasses around our infiltration basin, including some non-natives. And you can just stay where you're at or wander over here. I'm going to talk from where you're at and where I'm at. This one right here is a Miscanthus, Miscanthus sinensis. It's called Morning Light. And this is a Chinese grass, actually. Gorgeous flowers on it, although it doesn't seem like it wants to put up as many flower heads this year. Here's another uh, stray wandered over here from this patch. And we have deer grass, Muhlenbergia rigens. I love this plant. It's the regular go-to grass that you'll find everywhere at Armstrong and whatever. Same behavior. When it looks scrappy, just take it down and shear it off. And there are different varieties of Muhlenbergia. There's a pink one, the Capillaris, which is gorgeous. There's even a white variety that they were selling at the gift shop, too this deer grass. Otherwise, it's kind of a straw colored uh, flowering. And this will be a, a, an array of grass and flowers when it's full size, right? Lovely, big, rounded, mounded form. And that's a singular clump grass. Let's see, I think we're nearing the end of our time. In fact, we're over time. Let's go back up into the shade and we'll make sure everybody's on that list, sir. What's the name of that? This one is also the Miss Campus Morning Light to push the fruit faster. What's its lifespan? That's a great question. I don't know. Okay. I don't know. Chinese say 10 years. 10 years? But I okay. don't really believe it. It will produce, but it's much less after 10 years. Okay, so the best is before 10 years. Yeah. Okay. That 